Thank you so much, Thomas, for that introduction. And uh, thank you, colleagues, for being with me today. Um, I'm going to be talking about aspects of um, South African history that many people might not be familiar with. You might not be familiar with the broad contours of uh, South African history, but as I go along and introduce you to the people and the issues and the methods of research that I will talk to, um, they will fit into some of the ideas that you have about South Africa being a racial society, as in other words, a society that produced concepts of race, that had apartheid, that had a liberation struggle, that had liberation movements, and those liberation movements had a relationship between nationalism and socialism. And so I'm sure that there will be a range of issues that, um, you, that will be familiar to you. A few years ago, um, the Cape Town office of the African People's Democratic Union of Southern Africa Part of a small, if not almost forgotten, section of the liberation movement displayed a poster of a black and white portrait of Isaac Bangani Tabata taken in the 1970s. It was an enlargement of the image on the back cover, as you see here, of Tabata's book, Education for Barbarism which was an analysis of apartheid's Bantu <coughs> education system, first published in 1959, while he was banned, and then republished in 1980. Photographed from the chest up in a pose that had him gazing into the distance and dressed up in a gray suit with horn-rimmed spectacles and a pen prominent in his pocket, this was an image of Tabata as political leader turned into a realm of memory. On the back cover of the book, uh, the Tabata was described as an indefatigable organizer, orator, and writer, the leader of the late leader of the unity movement, the All African Convention, and the African People's Democratic Union of Southern Africa, who have been very active in the national liberation struggle of the oppressed blacks over 40 years. Now, not far away, in the District 6 Museum in downtown Cape Town, a large portrait of Tabata was installed as part of a portrait gallery. Tabata's image, large, light, and transparent, hung between other portraits of political leaders and writers from District 6. The same Tabata photographic image was also on display downstairs. Now, that's the image I'm talking about. The same image downstairs in the museum in an exhibition panel which reflected upon resistance politics and cultural expression in District 6. This time, it was printed in the form that the museum had acquired it. An Anne Fisher portrait from 1941, Anne Fisher ran a studio in Cape Town and had, at this time, very close relationships with different activists on the left. The image was cellotaped inside a makeshift soft brown frame. And in the panel, it was deliberately displayed alongside an image of playwright and author Dora Taylor in a narrative juxtaposition to indicate a close relationship, including one of biographic production. This was an image positioning that became a source of controversy in the museum. In different ways, then, the idea of Tabata as a leader to be commemorated was placed in a display environment which tried to transcend the frameworks of triumphal pantheon and illustrative image. In my work, I suggest it is possible to transcend conventional documentary methods of historical research 
by becoming more tuned to questions about the culture of politics. Political history and intellectual history can become open to cultural and even literary questions about the repertoires of resistance, the rituals of spoken words and speech genres in public gatherings, and the written transcripts and rhetorical strategies of the printed word. The unity movement and its structures were settings for the production of historical knowledge through different mediums of expression. And such knowledge was put to work in the service of the movement's objectives as they shifted over time under shifting conditions. As an indigenous emancipatory project with modernist overtones, what is conventionally named as the unity movement can be seen as an assemblage of forums, publications, and relationships, and organizational rituals. Together, these constituted a long-range, almost state-like project in public education, whose objective was the constitution of a new public domain as a rational form of social order, peopled by suitably conscious proto-citizens. And I say proto-citizens for this time deliberately, because this was a time of disenfranchisement. Through an analysis of power in society and the conditions of resistance and collaboration, a system of representation was created, complete with its own vocabulary, its own framing categories, its concepts, its own activities and procedures, through which the nation was defined, through which the enemy was named and conceptualized, and through which a moral code of behavior was counterposed to that of the enemy. This was in the wake of the Second World War. And those who worked with the state were regularly labeled through the nomenclature that had emerged out of the Second World War. They were labeled collaborators. They were labeled fifth column. These were the kinds of categories that were used in order to determine who was your comrade and who was your enemy to create the boundaries of those positionalities. These institutional settings also saw the evolution of a repertoire of rituals of assembly, research, and knowledge creation and dissemination. So one of the arguments that I make elsewhere in this manuscript, in this book, in formation, is that a layer of intellectuals or black intellectuals who had been thwarted from access to universities turned the political movement into their university arenas. This was when they did their politics, they were doing research. And so speeches, uh, they, they, they made speeches at public gatherings and in meeting halls which were like lessons in classrooms. And they conducted political tours, which were akin to field trips. A domain of publishing was constituted of leaflets, newspapers, pamphlets, and books, which were intended for the circulation of ideas, analyses, and concepts for the edification of the people, for the development of their consciousness, and the construction of an entire social and political imaginary. This was an arena of education that extended beyond the framework of formal schooling. An entire program in public education with its own pedagogy through which the nation was taken to school. The discursive construction of the subject in these spaces of knowledge production also raised questions about the collective and the individual, and history and biography, as political leadership was exercised through a politics 
of collective identification and mobilization. Now, political biography emerged as a key aspect of this knowledge system. And narrations of I.B. Tabata's political life produced and projected within particular biographic relations and under changing conditions were at the center of attempts to provide a historical basis for political claims. It was the written word and claims to authorship that provided the conditions of individuation and served as the threshold of biography. The emergence of a politics of presidentialism out of a prior emphasis on collective leadership was also discernible in photographic depictions. And I won't discuss them here. I'll just show you very briefly some of the examples of the transition from biographic, from photographic reticence. This was a time in the 1940s when Tabata hated the camera. He refused to be photographed. It is almost impossible to find photographs of Tabata for the 1940s. There's this accidental photograph taken while, while they were on an excursion in the, in, in the free state on their way to a meeting elsewhere in the country. And you can see he's taken off guard. He's without his spectacles. But there are two interesting studio portraits of Tabata taken by Anne Fisher. There's the one I showed you early, earlier and there is this one. But for the, for the, in the main, these are the only photographs that I have ever come across, as opposed to what happens later. This is the culmination of the embrace of portraiture, the embrace of the camera. This is the cult of presidentialism in all of its might. With, um, and I'll, I'll come to that later. Tabata's long-standing association with Dora Taylor was the key relation through which biographic representations of his life were produced. This occurred in what I call a borderland, a transitional space between the public and the private and the political and the personal that mirrored the cleavage between open and clandestine or underground political activity. In this perspective, it is also possible to look at reciprocal constructions and the ways in which people have narrated each other in relationships, especially ones that have been ongoing and formative. Now, narrations of Tabata's life emerged for the first time in tentative ways, more or less around the time of his arrest in the Eastern Cape, in the former Transkei, at a place known as Mount Aleph in 1948. These biographic intonations were taken further in 1956, when Tabata was banned for five years under the Suppression of Communism Act. And while repression served as an impetus for biography, the process of individuation that accompanied Tabata's writing and claims on authorship ultimately could not be contained within the principled code of collective leadership and the adherence to the principle that had characterized the movement's politics during the 1940s. Collective leadership as a cumulative system of ideas had previously been seen as an advance on an older system of the cult of the chief or the leader. It was seen as an advance on the older system of the reverence of the elders and the contempt for the young. Undoubtedly, this emphasis on the collective also gave individual security with safety in the collective under repressive conditions. And it also contributed to an impression 
of a wider political set of commitments and structures rather than the work of a small, even conspiratorial group. So for most of the 1940s, Tabata's writing and publishing occurred without authorship, behind a veil of collectivity, as a conscious and deliberate program of political intervention and textual production, which was incorporated into the political code of selflessness. And the anonymity of the pseudonym for almost all of his pamphlets and his writings in bulletins and newspapers and magazines was an attempt to shift the focus away from specific activists and producers of written ideas in order to encourage adherence and loyalty to the movement. However, Tabata's writing, whether or not under his own name or pseudonym, was not entirely individual. The Tabata collection provides ample evidence that his writing emerged out of his relationship with fellow Workers' Party member, Dora Taylor. Let me take you back to that image so that you can ponder that juxtaposition while I talk to you about Tabata and Taylor. This relationship was marked by an intense and ongoing political and personal interchange. Taylor had been immersed in a program of creative and political writing, as well as literary criticism. From the second half of 1941, the energies of Taylor's political analyses became directed towards assisting Tabata in the production of political interventions under pseudonyms. His writings were produced in a relationship with Dora Taylor at her encouragement with her active assistance and drawing on her prior experience as a writer. Sometimes she was secretary, wordsmith, grammarian, editor. Sometimes she was the amenuensis. But it is also possible to argue that she was also the silent, unacknowledged co-author. Taylor became immersed with Tabata in the almost daily work of written composition. Written composition as politics. Letters and telegrams to national and local leaders and activists. Inside the movement and outside the movement. Letters to newspapers, political manifestos, reports of meetings, drafts of written texts for movement pamphlets and newspapers, texts of conference speeches. Many strategic letters often saw substantial overwriting by Taylor. The adding of words into sentences and the incorporation of new sentences in ways that contributed substantially to their meaning. Sometimes, critical written interventions under Tabata's pseudonym seem to have had their origins in, te in texts in Taylor's handwriting, which may have resulted from dictation, but more likely may have been the product of joint thinking, discussion, and formulation. Indeed, it can be argued unequivocally that at crucial moments, Dora Taylor participated directly in the setting out of political policy and in the production of meaning in what was a single productive knowledge-producing unit. Through a series of publications from the mid to late 1940s, under conditions of deepening repression, Tabata began to risk authorial responsibility, which was both a political risk and a financial risk. This culminated in the publication in 1950 of a book called The Awakening of a People, published under his name. And this book became a manual of principled resistance methods. 
in the underground workers' party, which they were both members of, the publication of the awakening and the assertion by Tabata of individual authorship in the public domain was seen as an expression of impertinence and individual ambition and were deemed to be a deviation from centralized party authority and party discipline. The party ceased to exist from some time in 1950 or soon thereafter. And meanwhile, with Dora Taylor's assistance, Tabata began to assert an independent locus of authority from that formally provided by the party. He also began to shift away from a strategic immersion in a collective leadership and deliberately put himself forward as author of political histories, principles and strategies without a veil of the pseudonym. And this marked a new politics of personhood and leadership in which authorship served as the precursor of biography. Once the threshold of collective leadership had been crossed and the political practice of named, individuated authorship had been embraced as a deliberate strategy and calculated risk, Tabata could not go back to the era of commitment to policy and collective authority. By the 1960s, a shift had occurred from biographic ambivalence to a politics of presidentialism, in which Tabata's biography became a key aspect of projecting the movement in exile. This transition from collectivity to individuation is also the hallmark of the domain of visual representation. And a shift can be discerned in which photographic reluctance and reticence gave way to an opening up to the camera and the embracing of the codes of portraiture. Having previously rejected individual attention in favor of an adherence to political principles, especially that of the collective leadership, I.B. Tabata emerged as the most visible leader of the unity movement whose photographic portrait was widely circulated as the embodiment of its leadership. It was Dora Taylor who was Tabata's primary biographer, who produced the biographic narrations that were required as the politics of presidentialism took root in the 1960s as a decisive mode of political campaigning on the part of the unity movement in exile. Now, I.B. Tabata and Dora Taylor encountered each other for the first time in the circles of the Workers' Party in the mid-1930s. In 1936 or 1937, Tabata was engaged by Dora Taylor to sing in a cultural production for the Spartacus Club, the public culture debating forum uh, and lecture forum of the party and sang songs. He sang songs that had been composed by her. In a letter Taylor wrote to Tabata in the 1930s, Taylor made reference to their emerging common interests of cultural performance and social and political analysis. Dear comrade Tabata, uh, she wrote to him. J.G., Taylor's husband, suggests coming into our new office hall, our new hall next Saturday at 7 o'clock, allowing an hour at least for rehearsal before the lecture. That will save you the trouble of coming out this way. Please be on time and know the words of the songs. You know those which are quartets, let us know if the time does not suit you. Did you look for the article? Yours comradely, Dora Taylor. It is likely that they started working together beyond music and dramatic performance in the early 1940s as a party decision. Within the ambit of the discipline 
of the party. Tabata had been assigned the full-time party duties of intervening in the national struggle from the late 1930s in the All-African Convention and later in other public national formations such as the Anti-Colored Affairs Department and the Non-European Unity Movement. From about 1941, Taylor was authorized to assist him in these endeavors. In South Africa, this relationship spanned about 20 years of assistance by Taylor. And during this time, their relationship also took on other dimensions, incorporating the soft touches of music and literature alongside the heady strategic world of political intervention. And the, in the everyday intense, uh, intensity of these entanglements, they also developed a love relationship. What began as a working relationship as party members grew into a vital intellectual and emotional partnership which went through different phases in South Africa and overseas and lasted until Taylor's death in England in 1976. Their relationship was not a public one. In the first place, the political activities of the party were shifted entirely to the underground after 1939. Moreover, there was a racial dimension. White party members did not engage in public political work. Dora Taylor's intellectual and political work was necessarily, in the party terms, covert and even clandestine. Indeed, this relationship was conducted between the public and the private, between the official and the clandestine, which was simultaneously a space of desire. In the unfolding of this political and personal relationship between Tabata and Taylor, political commitment and allegiance to party and political principle became overlaid by loyalty to each other and mutual devotion. Taylor was utterly dedicated to Tabata, to ensuring the success of his political endeavors in ways that evoked the selflessness and duty to the cause that Tabata always spoke about. It was she who facilitated and assisted in the production of political ideas and strategies under Tabata's name. And this effacing of the self Effacing of the self on Taylor's part lasted until 1963, and that had left the feeling publicly unacknowledged. In return, Tabata supported Taylor's efforts at literary and historical writing and assisted in the attempts to have these published. These exchanges occurred in the everyday unfolding of their relationship. And so even when Tabata was away from Cape Town. Taylor was moved to write to him about feeling deeply lonely in the process of writing, about its progress and her discoveries in her research. In the 1940s and early 1950s, Taylor researched South Africa's colonial past, seeking to revise the distortions of history. Um, in 1948, after Taylor had completed writing a play about the killing of Hintza by the British forces in 1835, uh, it was marshaled in the service of building the movement. It was also out of this research on the killing of Hintza that a wider project about the role of the missionaries was initiated. And in 1952, in the aftermath of the campaigns against the Van Ribbeck Festival, which was apartheid's festival that made Van Ribbeck into the icon of European civilization at the southern tip of Africa, Taylor spent some time writing a history of missionaries and colonialism. And in the middle of 1952, while Tabata was traveling in the Eastern Cape, Taylor wrote to him extensively about her feelings of profound depression, even despair, and her frustrations with the process of writing. And 
of the frustrations at the process of writing history. Tabata replied, agreeing with her, that there were aspects of writing a book of history that may have been like a dull duty that had been imposed on her. One that did not give her scope to unfold her wings. However, he impressed upon her the importance of completing this project before she turned to her own political field of creative writing. In another letter written by Tabata to Taylor from Engobo at, in that same week, Tabata expanded upon his argument about the value of this book that she was writing, the role of the missionaries in conquest, especially after reading drafts from it to groups of rural people. Every evening they would gather around the fire and clamor for a reading. You know D, they referred to each other by Z. He referred to her as D, and she referred to him affectionately as B. My B, which was short for his second name, Bangani. You know, D, the work has sequence. One is conscious of shape and form, even in these few pages. You have managed to get over the dryness of a presentation of historical facts without resorting to floweriness of language or facile journalese. Tabata admitted that he understood Taylor's difficulty in being forced to bend her style and to cast it in a different mold. Taylor's style demanded the flight of creative imagination like Shakespeare's poet. History, on the other hand, he said, clips your wings and trammels your feet in shrubs of historical data. The end of 1952, the role of the missionaries in conquest was published in Johannesburg and its anonymous authorship was designated as Nosipo Majeke carefully chosen by Dora Taylor as a posaized version, rendition of her birth name, Dora Jack. Sipo is the Nguni word for gift, as Dora is a Celtic word for gift. And so uh, the posaized authorship, anonymous authorship of this book published in 1952 was given as Nosipo Majeke. Tabata supported Taylor in her writing and put some effort and enthusiasm into selling copies of a book as he never did his own. Um, he also reported to Taylor that her book had caused general excitement at the 1952 conference of the Cape African Teachers Association. It had been sold to the queerest assortment of people Students, teachers, peasants, storekeepers, ministers, school managers. It was a document worthy of pride of place in the literature of the movement. Then Tabata also admitted his own affinity for Taylor's book and claimed a seemingly acknowledged hand in its creation. What am I supposed to feel about it? Proud or jealous? I must confess I had what I imagined to be the pride of a father when he, conceive, when he receives the news in the next room that his wife has successfully delivered a son after a difficult labor. He feels as if he had something to do with it. Taylor recorded in her diary that the anonymity of the book's authorship and its publication in this way had been agreed upon to protect her Taylor may not have been a public activist, and the historical text may not have been the primary means of expression by which she may have wanted to enter the public domain and influence young minds. In addition, she had become accustomed to an unacknowledged and unacknowledgeable position of a clandestine and anonymous facilitation of political strategy and written political expression. 
Ironically, this anonymity was decided upon and came to define Taylor's relationship with the domain of public politics at the same time as Tabata had begun to emerge publicly as an individualized political leader and author of works under his own name. So while Tabata's position was consolidated as an individual leader, the publication of Dora Taylor's historical writing contributed to the entrenchment of her selflessness. Now, alongside their political work and authorship, they shared common bonds and passions over literature, over the works of Shakespeare, over the art of Chaplin. And they both became intensely aware of each other's strengths and vulnerabilities. And it is clear that by the late 1940s and early 1950s, they had fallen in love. Taylor reflected upon their mutual regard for Chaplin in her journal. While the medium of film may have been debased by mass production, she wrote, Chaplin had an ability to, to translate his personal experience in childhood into a universal waifdom. After having listened to a record at Taylor's house, which made him think of a bird with a broken wing, Tabata went to see the film Limelight. And even though Taylor could not have viewed it with him legally, Tabata knew that she was watching it with him. And when he called her afterwards to talk about it, he was too moved to say much as his heart was broken to see a great artist die. This shared knowledge was the source of the phrase broken wing, which Tabata used regularly in his communication to, uh, with Taylor. For Taylor, her own childhood had been characterized by rootlessness, which was the cause of what she called her uncompromising attitude to family relations. Her experience of having been abandoned and adopted in those first years of her life had made her stunted and warped through a lack of a child's first necessity, security. It also guided her intuitively rather than by reason. This psychology of the child as the human being who doesn't belong was also the psychology of the whole people of South Africa. This personal affinity should have enabled her to write truly about the social conditions of the oppressed. It was these emotional insights, with these insights, that Tabata encouraged Taylor to write. Um, as a way of addressing the tautness that is against writing, Taylor had learnt the necessity of the relaxation of the whole being from Tabata. Even with Tabata's encouragement, there were hurdles to be overcome. And as she wrote in her diary, in her solitary communication with Tabata, B, my heart is full, as if I were the young mother I was trying to create. I do not know what it is to feel as a daughter to a mother or to a father. It is a tremendous gap in the life of a child and somehow I must, I must convey it. It is the absence, the whole absence of a set of social sensations that must affect one's own experience as a mother with daughters. In spite of the obstacles and challenges, the result was her most mature work, The Rebel. Taylor recorded that she had finished the story for Tabata, for B, a work which was born out of the strains and pressures of the last six months. And in the 1950s, she continued to write for him, alongside the varied forms of support that she gave him with his political work and political writing. And 
In return for these services, Tabata continued to encourage Taylor's authorship and to champion the cause of its dissemination and publication. So in 1957, while he was banned, in a very, in, very interesting uh, correspondence, Tabata wrote to the London magazine with a, sh a short story written by Taylor called Tread Softly, which he asked to be considered for publication. In interceding for Taylor, Tabata introduced himself as an African, deeply involved in the activities of my people in their struggle for liberation, and as an author who had written a history of the movement in South Africa. And this, he said, qualified him to explain the significance of Taylor's text. Up to the first half of the 20th century, he suggested, South African writers had been mainly Europeans who wrote from a particular distorted angle and presented us as less than human, objects of pity or laughter, or as the noble savage. While some white writers since 1950 had written with a certain amount of sympathy for the African, they wrote as onlookers seeing us from a distance. Dora Taylor, on the other hand, he said, had transcended this distance. And according to Tabata, the story written by her in her own name indicated that she writes for us, not about us. And through this authorial location, Tabata contended that Taylor gave artistic expression to our feelings as human beings plunged in the various situations of the complex racial system of South Africa. Taylor wrote simply, he argued, without the intrusion of extraneous attitudes. Those outside may not understand how difficult this was because of the constant pressures imposed by the racial situation in this country. From the late 1940s, Tabata and Taylor's relationship was also a space of biographic production. Here they reflected upon and conceptualized and evaluated each other's formation as persons and writers. Uh, this intense space of authorial production, political intervention and biographic narration was a meeting place of the self and the movement, the individual and the collective, and the personal and, pol and the political. Now, to suggest that Tabata and Taylor's relationship was one of love and devotion may be interpreted by some, and indeed is going to be interpreted by some, as sacrilege against the memory of Tabata's public partner, Jane Gould was conventionally seen as the person with whom Tabata had established a lifelong political and personal partnership. At the same time, historians of the unity movement and literary historians have continued to refer to Dora Taylor simply as Tabata's friend, workers' party comrade and political secretary, or just a movement supporter. These conceptions have failed to understand the nature of this relationship and Taylor's significance in Tabata's political and personal life. They have also imposed a monogamist moral framework for comprehending these issues. Tabata and Gould were certainly comrades and lovers. Taylor, on the other hand, was married to psychologist and fellow party member J.G. Taylor, with whom he had uh, with whom she had three daughters, apart from Tabata and Taylor's immersion in other long-term relationships, the 1950s were also a time of absolute legal prohibition of sexual relations between black and white. Now, as I move to an end, I just want to introduce you to some more of their exchanges and correspondence. Uh, particularly as they express to each other the difficulties of being apart. Um, 
she re yeah, yeah, she recorded her anxieties of being away from, of being separated from her confidant. My B, I now know to the full the tricks which time plays during separation with no means of communication. The gap of time does not bear description and it has the effect of which falling must have. It paralyzes the whole being. Feeling, memory, imagination, perhaps in self-defense. I know what happens to you in this respect when you go out. And I've said, do you remember me? The question is not answerable in simple terms. And then when she was undertaking a trip to Bechwana land and Basutu land and Johannesburg for her research, she writes to him, I write home regularly to her husband and children. But I find I do not describe the same things to them as to you. Or is it to us too? Writing quickly both to them and to you, I do not deliberately make the difference, yet my mind remembers different things as the pen flows towards you. And then while he was traveling or while he was banned, she reflected on the importance of reciprocity in their relationship. It is so painfully one-sided, writing what I do and see and think with not a word of what you are doing and thinking, doing so much more than I. The essence of our rich relationship is its capacity to give and receive in equal measure, and this is violently broken at the moment. And then he writes to her, about the possibilities of being reunited. I'm looking forward with impatience to those few minutes of meeting you in Durban. I want to set my eyes on you and hear your voice speak and what of that laugh. If my eyes can take you in, my senses embrace you, my pores drink your presence, then I can go on indefinitely. So, During his ban, Tabata made a journey to the Eastern Cape to his mother's funeral. And for Taylor, this was a time when her affection, sympathy, memory, and anger against enemies, as well as Tabata's reverence for the dead, all commingled into the li living impulses, the, the, the living pulsing tissues of her brain, day and night, through work and even sleep. And she recorded her anguish about the public barriers against their togetherness and the heartache she felt about the necessity of their emotional denial, especially at that time. I feel the pang of being, able, of being unable to meet you with the knowledge that others will gather, gather around you as by right joyously surrounding you and you greeting them and returning to the house and talking and laughing and exchanging word and touch but I full to the brim with those burning images have no means of outlet no relief no possibility to go simply sit by your side and talk and talk and listen sharing all that you have been through instead of that I must remain quiet and passive and far away denied all natural expression of this tide of feeling. How should I then feel about a mounting pain as the hours pass, knowing that you can only come when it is convenient to come? What of all those burning images with which I have shared your absence? Must I carry them in my breast like a dead child? So, as I finish, um, I suggest that inside of this relationship of authorship and of devotion and of love, Taylor became Tabata's main biographer. It was as her own writing was getting rejected by publishers 
she increasingly devoted herself to supporting his political work. And even when, in 1963, she was admitted into a public position in the political movement, this occurred in a way that had her constantly supporting Tabata's political work, which was now conducted in exile in the settings of the, uh, of the organization of African unity in the quest for political support and financial support from African governments, from Zambia and Ghana in particular. And this required a political movement to look like a proto-government in waiting. And this was what generated this presidentialism. And going overseas on fundraising tours also required the movement to be presented as a proto-government in waiting. And it was Dora Taylor's work done in the selfless way that produced those biographies, that produced the narrations that eventually found their way into the anti-apartheid archives that were being constituted in uh, that were being constituted overseas. Mutuality gave way to presidentialism, and culture and literature gave way to political struggle. Taylor's intellectual life became increasingly devoted to promoting Tabata and his writings. Tabata's rise to the position of liberation movement president with the biography in the 1960s coincided ironically with publishers rejecting Taylor's literary works. Between February 1962 and June 1965, Taylor submitted a manuscript of a novel, Rage of Life, which drew upon her own experience of childhood abandonment to publishers. However, it was rejected and returned by all of them. It was only later published five years ago in South Africa. Saddened by the manuscript's rejection, Taylor found solace in her political work. Her political work in the movement in many ways continued to be an expression of selflessness and sacrifice as loyalty to the cause of liberation increasingly became defined as loyalty to Tabata. And perhaps the most significant biographical tribute to Tabata that Taylor constructed was the archival collection that entered the University of Cape Town from 1989, when the transition to democracy happened and the political movements were, began to return home and the exiles began to return to South Africa. This archive, constituting the foremost biographic ordering of Tabata's life, was the product of Dora Taylor's duty and service to the cause of the movement and to Tabata. The collection was not merely a chronological assemblage of the traces of Tabata's political career. More than a repository, it bore the traces of a range of interventions, mediations, and processes of production. And the primary mediation that left its mark on almost every feature of this collection was the efforts of Dora Taylor. Through the constitution of these papers as a collection in a university archive, Taylor's mediations and her and Tabata's relationship of politics, culture, and intimacy found a place in the academy and the institutions of public culture. Indeed, it might be more appropriate that the collection named currently as the I.B. Tabata collection should rather be thought of as the Tabata Taylor collection. And I'll leave it there. Thank you.